In 535 AD, scientific evidence suggests that a massive volcano erupted in the tropics. It threw up so much ash that it turned summer to winter. Crops failed for years. Drought and famine gripped the land. Millions died. For the last five years, David Keyes, a writer on history and archaeology, has immersed himself in this worldwide climatic catastrophe. By consulting historians, scientists, and in particular volcanologists, Keyes has concluded that the most likely culprit was the notorious volcano Krakatoa. An expedition to Krakatoa, which lies off the coast of Indonesia, further supported his theory. But Keyes believes that the eruption, the biggest in the last 1,500 years, was only the beginning. What followed was over a hundred years of upheaval that would change the course of human history forever. So what would the volcanic eruption of one and a half thousand years ago have been like? The amount of power generated by this eruption would have been equivalent to around 2,000 million Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs. The eruption of this ancient Krakatoa is something mankind has never witnessed, perhaps tens, hundreds of times larger than any volcano that's ever been witnessed. David Keyes asked volcanologist Dr. Ken Wolletz, an expert on Krakatoa, to feed all the available data about sixth century climate change into a supercomputer to simulate how the explosion began to unfold. I will start the simulation and will show several phases of the eruption. Wolletz has located the eruption in the Sunda Straits between Java and Sumatra. By combining tree ring and ice core data with eyewitness accounts of the dimming of the sun, it's possible to estimate how much material might have been thrown up into the Earth's atmosphere. With that figure, it's possible to calculate the scale and power of the explosion and associated after effects. Using Willetz's model, we have reconstructed the Krakatoa 535 AD Big Bang. A giant red hot fountain of molten rock and a vast cloud of ash towered over the countryside. Then, a second crack would have let seawater in. This caused an absolutely vast explosion, creating a 30-mile-high fountain of magma, dust and ash. Up to a 1,000 miles away, ash rained down on forests and fields. The towering clouds of steam and gas and ash pierced and shot upwards. And at times when it seemed like it could no, go no higher, it would continue to go high, eventually to the point where it started to block out the sun in all directions. And the gray white cloud would then start, see to sort of move laterally across the sky like a mushroom cloud. The fallout from the eruption would have been the natural equivalent of nuclear winter. So how did Krakatoa affect the world? Ken Wolletz has studied Krakatoa in detail, and he can see similarities between it and a huge dormant volcano near his laboratory, high in the hills of New Mexico.
The 15-mile-wide volcanic crater, or caldera, at Valle Grande, New Mexico, last exploded a million years ago. Ash from here landed as far away as Louisiana. Using the remains of Valle Grande, Ken shows how high-flying volcanic ash blocks out the sun. This is ultra-fine volcanic ash formed by Phreatoplinian eruption, similar to what we think happened in the 6th century at Krakatoa. It's so fine that even just a baby's breath of air will keep it suspended by minute turbulence. It will never fall to the earth as long as the air is moving, which of course it always does high up in the atmosphere. In 535 AD, similar microscopic particles of ash and sulfur dioxide from Krakatoa would have shrouded the whole sky, turning it endlessly gray. Temperatures dropped. Without the full strength of the sun to heat the oceans, less water would have evaporated and the atmosphere became drier and drier. As a result, there would have been progressively less rainfall. As a result, there were droughts and famines. Uh, very often at the end of major droughts, uh, you do get um, massive floods, and that seems to have been what occurred. But what fascinated David Keyes most was not the climatic catastrophe itself, but the possible effects on human civilization. I began to think to myself, well, disruption as severe as this has got to have political consequences. Because it's really the long-term consequences that I was interested in, in isolating, to see whether one big event can actually have a knock-on effect throughout history worldwide. Keyes decided to examine a series of historical puzzles of the 6th century AD. He looked at events which, from contemporary writings and archaeological evidence, were known to have taken place, but whose cause has never been properly explained. The first puzzle was the spread of a terrible disease which brought the greatest superpower of the time, the Roman Empire, to its knees. In 535 AD, under the Emperor Justinian, the late Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, was flourishing. But in 542 AD, something awful struck at the heart of Justinian's glittering empire. The horrors were described by a contemporary writer, a monk called Evagrius. With some people, it began in the head, made the eyes bloody and the face swollen descended to the throat, and then removed them from mankind. With others, there was a flowing of the bowels. Evagrius was describing a massive outbreak of bubonic plague, the first time it was recorded in history. But how could the plague have anything to do with the climatic catastrophe unleashed seven years before? Plague is a bacteria, a bacillus transmitted from infected rats to humans. The carrier is the humble flea which feeds on rats' blood. This is a flea which has had a, a blood meal and has no plague uh, organisms in its gut, and you can see that it's quite, stomach's quite full and everything's fine. If we look at, uh, if we contrast this with a, a flea which is taken up some of the bacillus. We can see that the, there's a blockage here, and this uh, is brought about by a reaction between the bacillus and the flea's gut. Now, the result of this is, of course, that the, the flea can't feed properly. And they become so ravenously hungry, because they, they, they begin to starve, in effect, that they, the more they eat, um, well, they can eat and eat and eat, and they don't satisfy their hunger because their gut is blocked and so they will jump onto absolutely anything in the chance of getting a, a free meal. 
as the rats themselves die from the plague, the flea has an obvious new target to bite for blood, humans. And then, as Evagrius describes, the agony begins. Some came out in sores, which gave rise to great fevers, and they would die two or three days later with their minds in the same state as those who had suffered nothing and with their bodies still robust. Others lost their senses before dying. What Keyes found out is that scientists now know that outbreaks of plague are strongly related to changes in climate. The sort of changes that followed 535, in particular cooling, could have had a huge impact on the spread of the disease. Temperature directly affects how the plague bacteria form in the flea's gut. Well, plague um, epidemics um, are temperature related. Um, what happens is that in the, in the gut of the flea, the, the fibrin clot only forms at temperatures below 25 degrees centigrade. Above 25 degrees centigrade, the clot doesn't form, and any bacillus is simply passed out of the flea with the faeces. If cooler conditions bring about the onset of the disease, did that happen in 535 AD? And if so, where? Well, according to one of our contemporary sources, the church historian Evagrius, the plague originated in Ethiopia. What we know, both scientifically and historically, is that the Great Lakes area of Central Africa is one of the oldest foci of plague activities uh, in the world, and that it would appear that the assertion of Evagrius is correct. Because Africa is normally hot, the disease is kept at bay. But if Africa was affected by the global cooling of 535 and 536, it would have been a lethal breeding ground for plague. From Africa, via the trade routes, ships, rats and sailors could easily bring the plague up the coast, first hitting the major port of Alexandria in Egypt and on into the heart of the Roman Empire. And Roman greed for one precious commodity from African elephants would only accelerate that process. In the sixth century, there was an enormous trade in African ivory. Hundreds of tons of ivory are being brought into the empire every year and being processed for luxury furniture, for luxury objects, which important magistrates would give out as gifts processed for diplomatic gifts that the empire could then use to impress his neighbors further to the north and further to the west, people who would never have seen an elephant in their lives. And it was essentially the um, uh, European and uh, Mediterranean greed for ivory that brought the roof in. Only seven years after the climatic catastrophe in 542 AD, on the back of the ivory trade, the plague surged into Constantinople. Its impact was devastating. We had to dispose of over 10,000 bodies a day, week after week after week, throwing them into the sea off special boats, sticking them in the towers of the city wall, filling up cisterns, digging up orchards. Soldiers were forced to dig mass graves in which to uh, cast the bodies of those who had died. The impression is one of chaos and pandemonium. Constantinople, Europe's biggest city, stank for month after month after month. One contemporary writer recorded that when the number of dead reached a quarter of a million, city officials simply stopped counting. As people left the stricken city, they took the plague to towns, villages, and farms throughout the empire. Untold millions died. And unknown to the empire, a second mortal threat was brewing 3,000 miles to the east. The climatic catastrophe was also having an extraordinary effect 
on an extraordinary people. They too would play their part in the decline of the Roman Empire. And the simple reason for this new threat was the difference between the digestive systems of horses and cows. In the isolated plains of Mongolia, hundreds of miles north of China, something strange was about to happen. Before 535 AD, the overlords of the region were a tribe of violent barbarian horsemen, the Avars. Chinese writers recorded their uncivilized way of life. These are uh, foul-smelling uh, barbarians from their point of view. Uh, with outrageous habits. The Avars never bathed, never washed their clothing. They cleaned their dishes by having the women lick them dry, uh, all of which was uh, simply horrifying to the Chinese. But in one respect, as both Chinese chronicles and archaeological finds show, the Avars were years ahead of the competition. Finds from archaeological digs all over Avar territories suggest that they were the most advanced horsemen in the world. Their style of riding, saddles and mouth bits are still in use by Hungarian plainsmen today. And many believe that the Avars almost certainly invented the stirrup. It was this large concentration of horses that gave them a, a military edge, the latest in the military technology of that era. The horses also provided food and sustenance. The Avars drank fermented mare's milk, uh, an alcoholic beverage. So horses were central to their existence. But then in 535 and 536, the years of the catastrophe, Chinese records and tree ring evidence from Siberia suggest that the Mongolian steppe was crippled by cold and dry conditions. The knock-on effect would have been long-term, lasting decades. By 552 AD, the Avars were attacked by a people who lived in the surrounding highlands, the Turks. They had previously been ruled by the Avars. Mysteriously, the once invincible Avar horsemen were crushed. Up until now, the cause of this sudden reversal of power has never been explained. But then David Keyes had an idea. So I was very puzzled by this and um, decided to try and, uh, try and find out uh, what the mechanism was. I thought, well, maybe it's something to do with their economy. Well, the Avar economy was a horse-based one. Uh, the Turk economy was a much more mixed one involving considerable numbers of cattle. The question came to my mind, well, was there something about the way that a cattle economy works and a horse economy works, the difference between those that might shed some light on the political events, on the demise of the Avars. Keyes contacted John Milne at Macaulay Land Use Centre in Aberdeen. Milne has made a detailed study of how different animals feed and survive. Yes, these horses here are, are actually Highland ponies, but in terms of the, the sort of size, uh, they're very similar to, to uh, what I believe the Avar horses would have been like. They're, they're quite similar to some of the, the, at least in terms of size, in terms of the Mongolian and, and uh, Kazakh horses that you, that you see now. Milne had done intriguing research into the difference between horse dung and cow dung. Here you can see some uh, horse dung, and you can see that the, uh, it's very fibrous, 
uh, which demonstrates, and it's made up of fairly large pieces of fiber, which demonstrates that this has not been well digested by, by the horse. Now, if you compared some cattle feces, you would see that it, it was much more uh, finely ground up uh, and, in fact, much better digested th than horse manure. Could the contrast in horses' and cows' digestive systems have made a vital strategic difference on the Mongolian steppes when, after the catastrophe, grass and vegetation were in a terrible state? Cows have a greater efficiency to digest food. They also have the ability to eat a wider range of different uh, herbage types, so that they can eat, for example, uh, very rank vegetation. In contrast, uh, the horses are, are less capable of eating rank, really poor quality vegetation uh, than cattle. And in a drought situation, you get you would get eventually to the state where the horse was not able to eat enough food. And because it was not been able to digest it successfully, then it, it would not be able to survive. And so in those in circumstances, then uh, the avars would, would be very vulnerable. I was absolutely amazed when, when, when I found that, in fact, it was uh, merely the differences uh, between a, a, a cow's and, and a horse's stomach design that had probably had uh, such a major effect on subsequent history. Chinese chronicles record how in the defeat by the once subject Turks, thousands of Avars were slaughtered or enslaved. Their leader committed suicide. Most of the surviving Avars began a 4,000 mile trek westwards. Their journey, triggered according to David Keyes by the catastrophe, was about to have a huge effect on history. The Avar refugee caravan cut across what is now northern Kazakhstan, skirting the northern shores of the Caspian Sea, and on into the fertile grasslands to the south of the Carpathian Mountains, an area which is now the Balkans. And as they traveled, the Avars recovered. Their horse technology was still superior to anything they found on their route. Once again, the Avars became a conquering people, driving all others before them. Until finally, Roman writers recall how they reached the fringes of the Roman Empire. They arrive in the late 550s as refugees. Within a decade, their ruthless horsemanship, ruthless military ability has come to dominate all the tribes, all the groups of Slavs, Huns, Germans, living north of the Danube on the empire's frontiers. And having imposed their control over these groups, the Avars can then turn their attention against the empire. The Roman Empire, already weakened by the plague, was constantly harassed by Avar incursions. At one point, Constantinople was besieged by the barbarians. Rather than take over, the Avars opted for blackmail and extracted vast amounts of gold from the empire in return for not fighting. Some of it can be seen today in museums. Much of it is still believed to lie buried in the plains of Hungary. It's reckoned that over 50 years, the Avars netted in today's terms seven billion pounds worth of gold from the Roman Empire. The Avar impact combined uh, with the uh, plague and the economic problems that ensued destabilized the empire. And at the end of the day, it can all be traced back to this um, climatic destabilization of the mid sixth century, uh, which was triggered by the volcanic eruption. David Keyes believed a pattern was emerging which showed huge political consequences stemming from the catastrophe. He had already found evidence of the catastrophe's effects throughout Europe and the East, 
now he turned to the Americas, where he found another extraordinary coincidence of timing and another historical puzzle where a great city had been destroyed, but no one had ever known why. In the early 6th century, 125,000 people lived in Teotihuacan in the central Mexican plain. In 500 AD, when the city reached its peak, it really was what is called a primate city. By that I mean the second next largest city is so far below it in size that there really, you could almost say there are no other cities. I mean, that's an overstatement, obviously, but there were cities of 10,000 people, 20,000, but compared to the 125,000 here, it was nothing. So it was the only huge, large city in the entire central Mexican plateau. Then, midway through the sixth century, shortly after the 535 AD catastrophe, things began to go wrong in Teotihuacan. For the past 20 years, Rebecca Story has been painstakingly studying skeletons of people who lived in one of the city's suburbs called Clahinga. The bones provide a remarkable history of the population's health. Well, the Clahinga population has um, adults. It also has quite a few children and an awful lot of babies. Rebecca Story began to notice that in Teotihuacan's later period, the population, in particular the babies, suffered a severe decline in health. These kinds of infections that show up on the bone are long-lasting bacterial infections, and they're very common on the children. Now, babies shouldn't have infections like this. Normally, they should be born with relatively good immunological protection from their parents, their mother. But in the case of Tlahinga, we find lots of babies with already infectious reactions indicating that the health of the mothers was so poor that the children are getting sick as well. The problem with the, the very late population there around the sixth century is that overwhelmingly it is babies, children, and individuals under the age of 25. They should not be dying at that proportion. So they start to become 70% of my sample rather than the much lower 40 or 45% that they were in the earlier period. It is a population that is in great trouble and is probably collapsing. New scientific evidence suggests that the city's decline occurred around the middle to late 6th century, 150 years earlier than previously thought. For David Keyes, this redating was a breakthrough. Now, in fact, one can see that uh, Teotihuacan's fall um, really f comes straight on the heels of the climatic disaster. And I think that there's a very, very high chance that the two are, are connected. There are no existing tree rings or other evidence from Mexico itself to show whether there was a significant climate change. However, lake deposits in the nearby Yucatan Peninsula show a 30-year-long drought starting in the mid-6th century. Tree ring evidence from Chile and California shows a dramatic reduction in tree growth from the late 530s onwards. And a study of river levels in Colombia shows that the mid to late 6th century was the driest period in the last 3,000 years. The evidence throughout the Americas, combined with Rebecca Story's findings of malnutrition, suggests that Teotihuacan was gripped by a long-lasting drought, a drought which, according to David Keyes' theory, was directly linked to the climatic catastrophe and had a devastating effect on the city's supply of food. When something happens to the food supply, well, that makes people more subject to getting ill because they're not getting enough food. Then this is a very dry environment. 
water had to always have to been a very important thing. And without water, you have very great sanitation problems. Sanitation would then lead to lots of diseases circulating through the people and causing mortality and ill health. And that affects the productivity of a city. A city's not productive when it's people are sick. And that becomes one of the things that then say, well, no, we don't want to go to Teotihuacan anymore because it's not a good place to be. According to the latest research, Teotihuacan was finally destroyed when the people rose up against their leader, smashing their palaces and setting light to the city's biggest temple. Somebody went in there and set fire to all the roof beams and caused the ceiling and roof to collapse, bring down the upper walls and form a big mound of debris. And that's what happened all up and down the main street of the city. Maybe they decided that elite class that was making demands on them was asking too much, that the priests who were supposedly bringing the rain and making the springs flow were no longer successful because the, uh, because the spring flow was dropping and the rains were diminishing. Uh, and they lost confidence maybe in the priestly class as well. What appears to happen is that you've got a destabilization, um, perhaps some religious and political changes, followed by a revolution of some sort and the collapse of the city. In a way, similar to events um, in, in Europe, indeed, in the way that Constantinople, uh, the Roman Empire, was affected. Five three five um, disturbs the status quo and allows history to reform itself all over the world. It really is the interface between the ancient world and the world we live in today. In central Mexico, it took 300 years for a new civilization to establish itself. Throughout the sixth century, a similar story was unfolding all over the planet. Ancient civilizations crumbling, others just beginning. And according to David Keyes, one example of an emerging nation was England itself. Britain in the mid sixth century, the Dark Ages, the Romans had left a hundred years earlier. In the west of the island, native British tribes, the Celts, fought to stem the tide of Anglo-Saxon invasion from northern Europe. According to legend, it was the time of the death of King Arthur. His country turned into a wasteland. As he rode thus through the land, he found trees down and grain destroyed, and all things laid waste, as if lightning had struck in each place. He found half the people in the villages dead. The earth no longer produced when cultivated. From that time on, no wheat or other grain grew there, and no tree bore fruit, and very few fish were found in the sea. For this reason, the two kingdoms were called the Wasteland. But could the Wasteland of legend be a distant memory of a climatic catastrophe that really did hit the native British, as a result of 535? What is certain from British and Irish annals is that the bubonic plague, which had devastated the Roman Empire, finally reached Britain by around 547 AD. It entered mainly through ports on the Cornish coast, from which the British still traded with the Roman Empire. This was a significant event in the um, history of Western Britain and Ireland. Certainly, as one goes through the annals, one can find many references to plagues. One of them is referred to as the Mortalitas Magna, the Great Mortality. Another one is the Mortalitas Prima, the first plague like this. This does suggest something special. They'd never experienced the plague before. 
Uh, it was a completely uh, new horror that they, they knew nothing about. They wouldn't have understood even what was happening. Suddenly people began to develop these terrible um, pustules underneath their armpits, in their groins, and they would have died in the most terrible agony. According to Keyes, the plague changed the political shape of Britain. At this time, Britain was divided in two. In the west lived the native Celtic Britons. The east was occupied by invaders from Europe, the Angles and Saxons. East and west had very little contact with each other. The Celtic Britons traded with the Roman world. The Anglo-Saxon peoples traded mainly with their former homelands of Germany and Scandinavia. It meant that the Celts, the native Britons, were far more exposed to the plague arriving from the Roman Empire. So by the time you come into the latter part of the century, the Celtic West and Centre have, been, have experienced a huge population reduction. There's a population vacuum. And so Anglo-Saxon peoples are able to move from the east, they're able to move west into partially empty lands. And uh, England was, was born. Keyes's theory is that England came about because the Anglo-Saxons were able to defeat the plague-stricken Britons. A sixth century poem tells of the defeat of one group of Celts, the men of Godothin and their leader, Madol. He did not retreat from battle until blood flowed. Like rushes, he cut down men who did not flee. The men of Gododin relate on the floor of the hall that before Madog's tent when he returned, there would come but one from a hundred. Neither lie. can see 535 as a watershed, where you see the, the forces coming into play which create um, such countries as England, uh, Spain, France, Japan, the United China. Now came the final and boldest turn in his theory. Could it be that the catastrophe was linked not just to the emergence of new nations, but also to the birth of a new world religion, Islam. This is all that is left today of the Marib Dam in Yemen, at the southern tip of Arabia. But at the beginning of the sixth century, Yemen was the region's greatest power. It depended on the Marib Dam its greatest piece of engineering. The Marib was huge, 2,000 feet long, feeding into hundreds of miles of canals. But within a few years of the 535 catastrophe, climatic chaos hit Yemen. First drought, and then a succession of storms and flash floods which weakened the dam. The constant attempts to repair the dam are recorded on contemporary inscriptions. What we're looking at is one of the great inscriptions that was put up on the uh, facade of the dam, really commemorating the rebuilding in this, of, of the dam, the repair of the dam, in this case in the year 542. And it's, it's a long inscription describing all the various people who came and contributed to this. And we can pick out right in the center here the cartouche, the symbol of the ruler of uh, the kingdom at that stage, one Abraha and there are a whole series of these inscriptions uh, for about two or three hundred years, and then they stop, which is very indicative of exactly uh, what the Arabic sources are telling us, that there was a period when this dam was broken and was not repaired again. The Marib Dam was abandoned. Its ruin 
was also the ruin of Yemen. Its population migrated to a new regional power base which emerged in its place, around Medina and Mecca. In 570 AD, the prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca. It's in precisely that Mecca, Medina area uh, that Muhammad was based. And so it's really uh, the growth of Medina as a, um, a important political center that is so crucial in the early development of Islam. The climatic chaos had not only smashed the Marib Dam and shifted power to Medina, it also brought Muhammad's own family to prominence. The uh, Prophet's family, or the Prophet's ancestors, had um, taken it upon themselves, really, to provide food, to import food into this area and provide food for the population. And this was one of their claims to, to, to fame and to status. Muhammad's family's reputation for social concern helped his ministry take root in a time of drought, famine and the plague which had spread from the Roman Empire. I think Muhammad's message was attractive because this was a period of upheaval and disturbance. One's got this whole apocalyptic atmosphere in the ancient world at that time. There's been war, uh, there's been a revolution. The Roman Empire, which had really dominated the political scene um, for, what, 800 years, appeared to be tottering. There is a lot of apocalyptic literature from this period. There are a lot of people saying, this is terrible, the world's coming to an end. How do we interpret these disasters? What are they a sign of, and so on. The political certainties of the world were collapsing around everybody's ears. Uh, nobody seemed sure of the future. Um, it was a, a very, very unsettled time to live. All these things uh, can be traced back uh, to an extent to the uh, climatic chaos caused by the eruption of 535, and they all feed into the early evolution of Islam. Now, if a volcanic eruption 535 could wreak all this um, havoc and draw the ancient world to a final close and really help lay the foundations of the world we live in today, what would happen if there was another massive eruption? This is not fantasy or wild speculation. While nothing may happen in the next hundred years, there are a handful of underground volcanic monsters whose arrival date is long overdue. The granddaddy of them all is believed to be Yellowstone caldera in Wyoming. This caldera is maybe twice the size of any known modern caldera, and its eruptions, which have occurred not once, not twice, but three times over the last two million years, indicate that it can, has devastated Northern America several times. Uh, besides Long Valley caldera, there's a caldera in California, which is also heating up. Uh, the ground is shaking there. Uh, there's been uh, uh, die off of the forest by uh, noxious gases, carbon dioxide coming out of the earth. Uh, public is very concerned about that volcano. Closer to home uh, for some people would be uh, the area around uh, Naples, Italy. Sure, it's famous for Vesuvius, which has erupted many times in the past and potentially will again in the future. There is also a caldera just on the north side of Naples, underlying a metropolitan area of Campi Flegrei and Pozzuoli, where 
thousands of people live and have lived for a long time. The last eruption in the Campi Flegri complex was in 1538. At that time, 3,000 people were killed by the immediate explosion. Now, 400,000 people live within the same area. The whole complex is still active and capable of major eruptions. Uh, that would be a total disaster for Italy, a major disaster for Europe, and um, would no doubt have worldwide climatic repercussions, uh, which would have huge implications for agriculture, uh, huge implications from a disease point of view worldwide, uh, and would no doubt have the effect of destabilizing all sorts of potentially unstable countries all over the world. It would change our climate. It would produce a uh, change in the pattern of wet and dry cycles uh, for vast portions of the Earth. We're familiar with the El Nino and La Nina effects. This would be even a much greater perturbation, uh, perhaps uh, lowering the temperature, the uh, global average temperature several degrees or more. The biggest effect for, for people anywhere is that it's going to disrupt they're the food supply, uh, and it's going to take years to, uh, for the climate to either go back to normal or for people to uh, uh, change the, uh, the crops that they use and the, and the way that they plant them. There may not be food to import from other countries because they'll need it every bit as much or more than, than we will, and if our agriculture has failed in some way, then there just wouldn't be enough to eat. I mean, that's. That to me seems to be the logic of the situation. Now, in times past, you're right, subsistence economies, if they had low population densities, they could go to the seashore and live on shellfish. And indeed, people sometimes did that under really stressful conditions. Uh, but you can't do that nowadays. There aren't enough shellfish to go around. If we are confronted with a global event at any time in the future, um, it's not quite clear how we would cope. The whole infrastructure of civilization will collapse around us uh, due to the huge environmental catastrophe that, that would uh, happen um, because of the failing of uh, crop production, the darkening of the skies. Communications would, would be taken out, satellite communication. Uh, aircraft uh, transport would uh, be interrupted very severely for a long period. That, that type of event will occur in, in the future. Well, people start to struggle for resources. I mean, and basically that means warfare. And in the modern world, it's not quite clear exactly what would happen. You either sit and starve, or you get out there and try and acquire food. And there's not much alternative in a, in a really stressful situation. One of the big lessons from 535, I think, is that we're not talking about a big bang and then the world changes. We're talking about a big bang and then it takes 100 to 150 years for the new reality to actually emerge. What will happen in the future, of course, one doesn't know. But I think that um, uh, historians, uh, economists, politicians uh, should really pay rather more attention, perhaps, to uh, the ability of natural forces to change history than they do at the moment. <laughs>